going to start our program. Yash is going to be chair. Our first speaker is I Amin, mean, right? Yes. yes. So I'll let Yash uh, take it away and introduce our first speaker. Thank you all for coming. So we have Amin Saberi from Stanford. Uh, he's <coughs> going to give us some open problems on ride healing and tell us about some of his work. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, okay. The mic is working. Yeah. Matching is the most central problem in algorithm design and combinatorial optimization. It has roots in the work of giants like Euler and Kirchhoff. It's been crucial in the development of theory of computing and polyhedral combinatorics. Uh, Edmond's paper on finding matchings in general graphs uh, had also this developed this notion of good algorithms, what we call now polynomial time algorithms. Karp's paper that reduced a few combinatorial uh, optimization problems to each other, problems that now we call NP-complete or NP-hard, had um, three-dimensional matching as one of the uh, examples included there. And now, with the advent of uh, new applications in online markets like online advertising, um, ride sharing and ride hailing applications, and several other matching markets for the allocation of organs uh, to patients, uh, students to schools, uh, um, uh, kids to foster homes. Uh, we are facing a lot of very, a lot of new and interesting applications of matchings. And uh, these applications have also led to um, uh, many intriguing questions and uh, difficult, uh, challenging open problems. Um, one of the uh, interesting aspects of the markets here is that they are dynamic in the sense that the matching we need to find in a graph, the graph is not given to us in one shot. We get it in bits and pieces. And we have to make decisions about you know, who to match to whom uh, with partial information about the future. And that makes actually the problem quite um, difficult. Um, here is one uh, application that, um, or two applications that we are looking at. Um, so here, um, in this graph, this is the life expectancy or additional life expectancy of someone who has a renal failure, has a kidney failure. So if someone is in their 30s and they have a kidney failure, they have about 10 years on dialysis. So essentially you have 10 years to find them a match, to find them a kidney. On the right, this is uh, Uber. If you want to, you know, if you make a request for a um, ride share, typically the app gives you a window. So it says, you know, I'm going to find a, a ride for you in three minutes or in five minutes. Essentially, it, the app gives itself this time to find the best ride that's a good match for your ride and uh, you know, use this window to improve the quality of the matching. So in both of these applications, we have, uh, every time we have a request for a matching, we have some window. We have a bit predetermined, you know, sort of we have a fixed window in which we want to you know, find the, uh, a, a match for the request. Um, another thing that these two applications have in common is that here, if you come up with an algorithm that improves the quality of matching, um, it leads to you know, increased life expectancy, improved quality of life. And there, again, a better algorithm for matching would reduce the driving time, reduce the weighted time, reduce you know, uh, the wasted time, or um, again, uh, you know, sort of traffic and pollution. So in both cases, you can contribute to the social good. All right, so I'm going to define a very simple uh, formulation uh, that tries to capture the essence of these problems that I described to you. Um, we're going to have a graph G with n vertices. The graph is arbitrary. Uh, the weights are also, you know, the, for every pair of vertices, there is a weight. That's the value you will gain for matching these two vertices to each other. The weights could be arbitrary too. Uh, so essentially, adversary chooses that. Once the graph is determined, vertices of the graph arrive in a random order. So every time, in every time a step, a new vertex arrives, 
and then you have d steps. It stays in the system for d steps. So essentially, you have d steps to match that vertex. In other words, um, two vertices can be matched to each other if the you know if the you know the intervals in which they are present has an intersection. Um, vertices come one by one. You decide you know who to match to each other, and then at the end. Uh, you get some matching, and your goal is to maximize the expected weight of the matching. Is the problem clear? One question. Yes. Do we, oh, is this information coming online, or do we see the time sequence? No, the information is coming to you online. So the, yeah, you get the information one by one. Every time a new vertex arrives, you can observe the weight of the edges uh, between that vertex and other uh, vertices that are present. All right. And I'm going to look at, uh, at the start, I'm going to look at a very simple policy, a very simple algorithm for matching these vertices to each other. We call them the batching algorithm. So the way it works is that you wait for D steps. As soon as the very first vertex that I have is about to go, you look at your market, and you find the maximum weight matching there. Essentially, you try to clear the market. Then you wait another d plus 1 steps. You see who else is present. The ones that you match or not match before are gone. You have a new set. You match those, and you keep repeating this. So that, that's what we call the batching algorithm, probably the simplest algorithm you can think of. Right? Um, um, it's like, you know, for example, in the context of Uber, let's say every 10, 20 seconds, you know, uh, uh, Right, you know, hailing application can look at all the cards that are present, all the requests, and find the you know best matching. So uh, people who come at the end of the window are least optimally matched. Um, no, like if you are the last person, again, there are d plus d vertices before you that you can be matched to. So everybody has the same degree in this graph. Uh -huh. Right. So. Um, Right. They have an advantage. They will be immediately matched. So here, I don't have a cost for waiting. In fact, the first ones are the yes, they, they have to wait longer. Yeah. And here, nobody has to accept or reject. Right? You give them the match, and that's it. Yes, I give them the match, and that's it. Yeah, so um, you can, no choices. You can think about cases where there is a cancellation probability, but it's not within the framework of this. And here's the question. You know, does uh, batching yield the best competitive ratio for this problem? So what is the competitive ratio? Competitive ratio is the worst case ratio between the solution of the algorithm over the optimum solution. So in this case, you know, you run your algorithm. You get some solution. You will get some matching. It has a value. Then you can think about, oh, what if I knew everything? You know, if like the arrival of every vertex, and I computed the maximum weight matching, then look at the ratio of the two. Look at the worst case over all possible instances, over all different graphs. That would give you the competitive ratio. And the question that we have is whether this is the best thing you can do. But yes. I think I'm right. The guy who comes in the end. Okay. Best match is about to come in the next time period. That's true for everybody. That's true for everybody. Yes, but the earlier ones cannot wait anymore, so all their matches are here. So let's say you are in the second batch, and you're the first person. Yeah. Maybe your best batch just arrived before you, but I batched, matched him away. So, so even the first vertex can say, can have the same complaint. Give right. me. What's interesting yeah. about that is the opportunity cost of letting a match, let someone die without being matched, right? There's going to be some expected future benefit for right. the next arrival. Right? Sure. That's what Jay is getting at. Um, yeah. Actually, I'm going to uh, yeah, okay. give me a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll see. Um, so very nice problem. <laughs> we don't know how to. <laughs> we don't know how the answer to it. Uh, this is the best thing we can do. Uh, we say the batching algorithm with batch size d plus one is at least um, like around one third, point two seven of optimum. Moreover, no algorithm can achieve a competitive ratio better than half. Um, so there is a gap. Sorry, when you say no algorithm, do you mean no batching or no algorithm period? No algorithm period. Okay. 
deterministic, randomized, quantum. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. The benchmark is the offline solution, but with the same constraint. That with the same constraint that the two were, yes. Yeah. So you can't vertice, match vertices that are too far apart, but you know the future when you decide. All right. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give you the outline of the proof of that statement. Um, the proof is actually not very difficult. If I do my job well, and if you listen, you know, sort of carefully, hopefully by the end of 10 minutes, you can at least know the outline or you can reconstruct the, uh, the proof offline. So it's going to have three steps. One is that I'm going to look at this optimization, this competitive analysis, and reduce it to a graph problem, a graph covering problem. Then I'll introduce two amplification gadgets that say you only need to do the analysis for a small n. Uh, that would give you uh, something for large n, and then from a small d to large d. And then once we establish this, we only need to look at small n, n and a small d. For that, we use a computer-aided, essentially linear programming-based proof. Uh, and um, you know, sort of simple notation for any graph h, m of h is its max weight matching value. So that's what I'm looking for. Uh, if I have two graphs, if I write f star h, I mean the product of the two graphs. And in the sense that, let's say the two graphs have the same set of vertices, I'm going to just take the product of the weights. Um, I'll be also having these operations. I'm going to be adding two graphs, again, with the same vertices uh, to each other or compare two graphs. There, think of these as their adjacency matrices. So when I say h1 plus h2, essentially I'm putting two copies of this, you know, h put, putting a copy of h1 on top of a copy of h2. And then h bigger than or equal to g, meaning like if you have an edge here, you definitely have an edge there. Or the number of edges between two vertices, uh, i and j in h, is bigger than or equal to the number of edges between i and j in g. Are these all complete graphs? No, uh, general graphs. So why don't you have to tell us about the, the edges of f and h? Yes. Yeah. So I'll, in a, let me show you one construction, and then it will be clear. So the graphs that I'm interested in are of this form. So think about the optimum solution. The optimum solution can match every vertex with the vertices that arrived up to d steps before and up to d steps after. So I construct this graph in which, for any permutation, I connect every vertex to up to d vertices before and up to d vertices after. Now, once you put the weights here, the maximum weight matching in this graph is going to give you the optimum solution. So for any permutation, I get a different uh, graph that looks like that. Essentially, uh -oh. optimum offline collects the matching of this is the optimum for that part, you know, this is the graph for that particular permutation times g. These are the weights uh, of the, you know, the values that you will gain from matching every pair of vertices. Is that clear? Right. Now that's the performance of the matching. What about the batching graph? Well, Batch essentially looks, you know, the, if you look at the support graph of batching, it's a combination of, uh, it's a collection of complete graphs. Because every d plus 1 steps, I look at all these vertices, and I find the maximum weight matching here. Then again, I find the maximum weight matching after you know, 2 d plus steps and so on. So essentially, the performance of the matching for a permutation is the maximum weight matching in this graph. Right? So now, what I have to do is I have to compare the maximum weight matching in these two between you know, sort of optimum and batching. And that, yes? In the previous picture, you, you said you are limiting the number, like how far a match could go. Right. What's the rationale for that? Just an issue of complexity, or is that a constraint? No, it's like imagine people are arriving one by one and request a ride share, and the ride sharing application tell each one of them three minutes. Okay. So essentially, when you arrive, you can be matched to vertices that arrive up to three minutes before you and up to. I guess you could say 12 minutes. Yes, right? but. That would increase it, right? Yeah, definitely. So let's say three is a parameter. 
it's like the quality of service guarantee that we have uh, for the for the application. So it's part of the input. Uh, you know, for based on some calculations, you decide uh, that you know three is about right. The users won't be too unhappy. Um, because it seems if I if I think of the constraint optimization problem, right, this three becomes a constraint. Yes. And then it itself could be an endogenous parameter. True. But then there would have to be a cost of increasing it or something like that. Yes. So here is a you know one question of maybe optimum can wait you know d steps. What if I allow you a little bit more? Can you do as well as optimum? It's like maybe I give batching twice as much time. Can it do as well as optimum? It's a very nice question. We don't know how to answer that either. Uh, this is actually an open problem I think posed by Ola Svensson and. Uh, we tried it for a couple of days. We couldn't nail it. So there again. I think your parameter should be more than two days. Oh, I see. Right. Well, I'm telling you, like, uh, I, yeah. Uh, I was so I was there for a week, but Lausanne is beautiful. So <laughs> uh, we really didn't get enough time. Uh, so here is the trick that moves the problem from you know, the optimization to a graph, uh, realm of uh, optimization to a graph theory. I say a set of graphs, H1 to HK, is a cover of a graph H if essentially if you add the multiple copies of HIs on top of each other, you will get a super graph. Um, so H is less than or equal to H1 plus HK. I can also define a fractional cover in which I take these copies of the graphs, multiply them to some scalar. Essentially, I get these fractional edges. And then I put them on top of each other, and I get a new graph. So I say, if there exists sigma 1 to sigma k, uh, so these are permutations, and these scalar numbers lambda 1 and to lambda k, such that some of the lambda k is equal to alpha. And if you look at the batch for these permutations, this linear combination, covers the optimum for some permutation, let's say identity, then batching is 1 over alpha competitive. Right? Essentially, it says if I look at you know, these different copies of the batch for different permutations, and I can cover the optimum graph, then the maximum matching I find in each one of these copies, I can put them, you know, sort of become a matching in the original graph, in the optimum graph. So a simple. Uh, the change of order will tell you that the, um, the size of the, the linear combination of the maximum weight matchings in this graph is bigger than or equal to the maximum weight matching here. So um, now all I have to do is that I, can, I have to take the optimum graph and cover it with these batch graphs. And if I can find a small cover, I have found a good bound for the competitive ratio of my algorithm. I hope that's clear. Now, I'm going to show you these two gadgets, these two amplification gadgets, one that goes from a small end to large end. So we're going to use these periodic permutations. We say a permutation is p-periodic if essentially it's repeating itself. So sigma of i plus p is equal to sigma of i plus p mod n. And now, I, if I have a periodic permutation for d and n, um, so instead of having it on a Path. Now I'm using a cycle because it just makes things a little bit nicer and more elegant. But let's say you have some permutation that repeats itself every d, you know, every p steps. I can open it up and I can repeat it. So essentially, I can re by repeating the pattern, I can say if I have a cover that's p periodic for some n, I can extend it to uh, for some n n prime if p divides n and n divides n prime. So essentially, I can you know, amplify uh, the uh, n. And even if these are not, you know, they don't exactly divide each other, uh, I will have some loss. But as n and n prime becomes bigger, the loss is small. So if you look at the paper, there is a more complex, uh, you know, sort of more complicated um, a statement of this lemma. But morally, that's what's going on. Now, I can also use a similar trick to go from a small d to large d by vertex duplication. So let's say I have some cover. I duplicate every vertex, or 
have multiple copies of that. And then it will give me another cover, this time for larger D instead of larger N. Uh, so again, the st actual statement is a little bit more detailed, but it says a cover of the contractor graph can be mapped uh, on the cover of the original graph. So you can go from a small D to large D, and a small loss if D does not divide D prime. So, so. now, since I have the amplification for a small d to large d and a small n to large n, I can you know, have an upper bound on d, let's say 50, and then try to find the best cover. It will be a linear program. Now that linear program has around 50 factorial variables. So that's, that's a big linear program to solve. But then there are some tricks to find you know, upper and lower bounds using the dual. So with some work, uh, some ground work, I should say. Uh, we managed to get some bound for alpha d, essentially you know, introducing solutions for d between 1 to 50. And then for d bigger than 50, uh, bound the uh, loss during to, you know, uh, uh, you know sort of these um, errors. And that would give you 1 over 3.5, which is 0.279 that I told you about. So. That's some bound. Uh, probably, you know, if you push 50 to 100 and do this a little bit more carefully, you can make it better. But um, uh, the question that's more interesting is whether you can get half and uh, whether there is a more elegant solution. Um, so before I, any questions? Yes. So are they fractional like this question? Oh yeah, definitely. So if you restrict yourself to integral covers, it becomes, the problem becomes much harder. Do you have any idea what these sequences look like? Just, or if you like, try to decompose it, is this Yeah, else? so because there is a lot of symmetry in the solution, the optimum solution has also, like, it's not a unique optimum solution. There is a class of optimum solutions. So then you have to decide how you break toys to see patterns and, uh, Someone should do it. <laughs> yeah. um, I didn't have the patience. So, uh, Max and I didn't have the, yeah, go ahead. So a quick question. So if you let the unmatched vertices of batch k to be used by batch k plus 1, so definitely you get a better solution. But do you get a better comparative ratio? Have you tried that? Say that one more time. So if you let the unmatched vertices of batch k to be used by batch k plus 1, because right now you just like remove, remove every vertex of batch k, no matter the match. Yeah, but you know, if the weights are non-zero, then most likely when you look for the maximum weight matching, you match everything to each other. Because if you have two vertices that are left out and the value between them is non-zero, you match them. So then you're talking only about parity of D. I don't think it makes a big difference. Yes? For any D, for example, can you try with LP to see like for some multiples of D, if it's an n to be called like some multiple of d plus one, did you try to find if like the LP always gives us two, or sometimes it gives us more than two, maybe? Um, yeah, so that's why I don't have like conjecture. You know, this is uh, just leave it as an open problem. My guess is that maybe for large enough n and large enough d, this is true. Uh, again. It's up to you to prove or disprove it. Uh oh. So I talked about the random order model, in which even though the graph was arbitrary, the vertices were arriving at random. Uh, in particular, all the permutations were equally likely. Let's say I remove this restriction, and the vertices can arrive you know, uh, uh, in some adversarial order. Essentially, there is some adversary that decides the, you know, what the graph looks like in every step. You know, gives you a vertex, gives you the, the edges. And the decisions of the adversary could even depend on your algorithm. Um, what happens then? 
So similar model, vertices arrive, they assign the system for D steps. You can match them if they overlap, if they are present at the same time. Your goal is to find the maximum weight matching. Um, in this model, the first observation is that not only batching doesn't do well, uh, you know, sort of does poorly, no deterministic algorithm can get a bounded competitive ratio. So think about D equal to one and N equal to two. So you have these two vertices and you can match them to each other and it will give you a value of one. Now you have to decide whether you match these two to each other uh, or you know, let go of this matching and then you will have a chance to match these two to each other. Let's say you decide that they are, you, know, you match them, then if X is very large, uh, you will have a poor performance. And if you don't match them to each other and X is very small, again, you will have a poor performance. So this tells you that no deterministic algorithm can achieve a bounded competitive ratio. And the best thing you can do here is actually to toss a coin. It's probably 50% match them and 50% not match them. So that tells you no algorithm can achieve a competitive factor better than half. All right. So now we give an algorithm with a, I'll give, show you an algorithm for, uh, with a constant competitive ratio. And there the are basically three ideas. Um, one is divide the vertices randomly. Similar to the argument I told you about the middle vertex that you have to toss a coin with probably 50% do versus one uh, or another. We're going to divide the vertices into two sets, patient vertices and impatient vertices. Patient vertices wait until the very last minute, until they're about to depart. Then they get matched to something. Impatient vertices, they can get matched somewhere in between their arrival and departure. And um, they get matched to a patient vertex. So when a patient vertex is about to depart, they get matched to it. And um, uh, so that's strictly before their departure. We're going to toss a coin. For every single vertex, we probably 50% is going to be patient or it's going to be impatient. Now, if you know which vertices are patient and which vertices are impatient, essentially you have a maximum weight matching problem, a bipartite version of the problem that you want to solve. And there are different ways to do that. So for example, you can reduce it to the framework of online matching with free disposal. Or there's actually you know, a very nice ascending auction algorithm with a primal dual analysis that gives you factor half. So in that case, the problem is reasonably easy to solve. Now. If I, you know, coin a toss, uh, if I toss a coin with probably 50% and do it independently for every single vertex, the probability that I get one edge right is a quarter, right? I have to decide the right way. This one is going to be impatient. This one is going to be impatient. So I lose a quarter here. I lose half here. It will be like you know one over eight. There is a way to make this better. You can postpone this partitioning. You can make these decisions about who is patient and who is not in a correlated way. So essentially, you create patient and impatient copies of each vertex. You make you postpone your decision until the very last minute. When the vertex is about to depart, you decide whether it's patient or impatient. And then you, well, by flipping a coin, and then you propagate that decision. Like you, know, you use an alternating path to uh, force the decision of some other vertices. So the algorithm looks like this. Um, at the arrival of vertex i, create a patient copy, create an impatient copy in a virtual graph. And um, that creates a bipartite graph in which pi is compatible with qj if j is less than i. And um, every time, match the pi to qj with the highest marginal edge weight. And then some i is about to leave, randomly match according to pi or qi, and then propagate the decision ac uh, across the alternating path. And we can show that this is uh, one-fourth competitive. Um, so I showed you a lower bound of half. That, old lower, that upper bound of half, that upper bound can be improved. So the right number is somewhere between these two. We don't know what it is. Uh, so actually, the open problems are you know, one is batching half competitive. As you mentioned, if batch 2d plus 1 as good as optimum of d, uh, best competitive ratio under the adversarial model. Uh, the question of cost of weighting came up. If you have different vertices with different sensitivity to weighting, like you know, maybe somebody needs a ride immediately or needs a kidney immediately, you know, you come from a distribution. How do you change your decisions there? Um, there's something that I'll talk about more, whether 
competitive ratio is actually a good benchmark for uh, looking at the performance of these algorithms. Um, but in my remaining, what kind of a chair are you? <laughs> Say that again. Oh, okay. So in my one, <laughs> there you are. No, I, I, in my, I, I'm going to use an, only another five minutes. So uh, easy. Um, I told you there are interesting open problems in this domain. Let me tell you my favorite one. It's a very simple, very elegant problem. So imagine you, know, you have a bipartite graph. It's unweighted. Um, the graph is given to you in advance. And even the left-hand side, the A side, is given to you. It's present. But the B side is generated sequentially and at random. So every time, one vertex from B is chosen. And the probability that vertex I is chosen is PI. A vertex can be chosen multiple times. Uh, so the vertex arrives, and then you have to decide whether to match it or who to match it to. And this, is ha this happens t times, from time from 1 to t. And again, the goal is to find the maximum weight matching at the end. Very simple problem, right? Sort of the adversarial version of that, where the graph is not given to you, and the vertices that are one by one, is the you know, uh, online matching. There is this you know, beautiful paper by Karp, Vazirani, and Vazirani that gives you the 1 minus 1 over E, the optimum algorithm. In the case where the arrival is not adversarial, comes from the, some distribution, we don't know the optimal solution. Uh, so I and some other people, I think I saw Vahide somewhere, uh, have contributed to reducing the gap. But there is a gap. And uh, now, that's one question. And you know, when you talk about the competitive ratio of the problem. But for a problem that's online stochastic, uh, the notion of optimum online is well defined. If you give me exponential time, I can actually write a dynamic program that would give me the optimum solution. So actually, the question that we have is computational. You can ask, what's the computational complexity of the optimum solution? Can we approximate it? Is there a difference between the approximation ratio and the competitive ratio? Is there any way to exploit this gap between these two notions? We don't know the answer to any of these questions. Um, with uh, Rod, uh, Ali, and Nima, we looked at this problem in the context of uh, online Bayesian selection, the profit inequality. And there, there is actually a difference, at least for some special cases, between approximation and the competitive ratio. For online matching, we don't know. Um, also, the computational complexity, you know, here's the conjecture that the problem is P a space complete. Uh, the class P a space is, uh, contains NP. It's believed to be much harder than NP. Uh, and uh, the conjecture is that it's complete for that class. Um, I think it's the recurring theme in this talk. We don't know how to prove that. Here is a problem we can do. Um, so look at the, we call this the right matching problem, which is very similar to what I just defined, except that the vertices have arrival time. So when you reach time t, you look at all the vertices whose arrival is exactly t, and then you choose them with probability pi. And then the algorithm has to match it. It's a slightly more general version of the problem. Um, for that, with Christos, uh, we can prove that the problem is PS space complete. So this is a reduction to the stochastic satisfiability problem, um, where in the you know, vanilla version of the satisfiability problem, you're given a Boolean formula, and you're looking for an assignment of true and false to satisfy the formula. Here, you have to give the values one by one. So you choose the value of x1, then x2 is decided randomly, with probability 50% x2 is true or false. Then you choose x3, and then x4 is you know, done randomly. And you're looking for an algorithm for which the probability that the, the formula is at the end satisfied is more than half. Uh, that's a version of the PS space complete problem that we reduce the problem to. So, in order to give a sense of the PS space completeness, all the partially observable Markov decision problems are in PS space. So essentially, this says this problem is at least as hard as any Palm DP problem. On the flip side, the positive result is that if the compatibility graph is, is decided by Euclid Euclidean distances, so essentially your vertices are in some grid, and they're compatible if they're within a certain distance, then there is a polynomial time approximation scheme for the problem. Yes. Is the uh, proof of 
PS-based completeness of uh, partial of whatever MDP uses the same problem for the um, Yeah, so when you look at a general palm DP, you can actually you know, sort of incorporate some finite state machines. So the reduction becomes simpler. Here, uh, you can have an implicit uh, representation of the palm DP. Here, since the problem is combinatorial, the reduction is combinatorial. So you have to actually build a gadget that reduces to the. Yeah. That is actually the result of, I think, Papa Dimitri and Sid Siklus, yeah. All right, good. So to conclude early, um, you know, problems in market design in general, but you know, sort of right sharing applications in particular, uh, give rise to a lot of interesting problems in algorithms and combinatorial optimization. Think about rider pricing, driver pricing, matching rights, um, matching riders to drivers, matching rights to each other positioning uh, drivers, uh, scheduling routes or determining routes in a static or dynamic way for mid and large capacity vehicles. Uh, they have a close connection to classic problems like online matching, facility location, traveling salesman problems, or the Bayesian selection problem, the, uh, also known as profit inequality problems. So there is a tremendous potential uh, for having an impact uh, Think about, I think, you know, these ride-sharing applications, some you guys know better than me, have tens of millions of rides per day. So because of the scale, because of the granularity of the data, and because of low cost of experimentation, it's possible to come up with new algorithms and try them and see if, uh, you know, you can see improvements. But um, I think we need to take a second look at our common uh, at, at our modeling practices and you know standard paradigms for evaluating performance of algorithms so like you know in theoretical computer science typically we do competitive analysis the sense that we optimize against an adversary that's going to come up with the input and since the adversary is determining the input the algorithm as a result is going to be very conservative it's going to make be very making very conservative choices Typically, you know, common practice in OR is that you assume that your input comes from some stochastic process. Like, you know, there's a Poisson point process that gives you the input. And I think assuming that the, the rate of these Poisson processes can be predicted or even measured, and then there is like some logit uh, function that determines the choice of the consumer, and that can also be measured, is incredibly optimistic. So after looking at it, you know, a little bit data and running a bunch of experiments, if I've learned one thing, it's that uh, we need uh, a new way of, you know, sort of mo like a second look at our modeling choices and new ways of evaluating the performance of algorithms uh, to come up with, you know, a new formal way of evaluating those so that we can come up with algorithms that are more impactful in practice. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm curious conceptually how you would think of the following. This relates to, to uh, the point that Vijay made earlier. So imagine the d minus 1 or d right, comes in. The graph currently has a certain set of weights, right? Yes. Uh, the vertices. And different matching, you know, you're going to have a maximal match. And now the d plus 1 comes in. Yes. Right? Um, that's going to create a certain new maximal value. Different Ds that come in will create different maximum, right? Different. Different, like the, the, the uh, parameters of that last one, yes. that, which could vary, are going to change the maximal value, right? So you could think that in anticipation of that last one, there's going to be some distribution. Of course, I'm not taking a worst case. I'm taking some kind of Bayesian. Uh, thought about this, there's going to be some distributions of the maximum value. And I could get a really shitty one come in, in which case, if I would have an ability to you know, basically have a loss of, I'm, I'm going to let someone die mm -hmm. right, without getting matched, because on expectation, the next one that comes in is going to increase the value of the whole match by a lot. Yes. Is there a way of incorporating these, and have these things been done? Yeah. Um 
in practice, I know it's being done. I don't know if there is a good modeling of that. So in, in theory, there's no difference between there's no, yeah. practice, but in practice, there's a lot. So um, yeah, true. Actually, you know, one of the challenges is um, when you have benchmarks that are so loose, like competitive ratio, a lot of different algorithms will look the same. But then when you look at it you know, in real data, then this small bits of you know, sort of information that you can get about the future can, and if, even if they are uncertain, can uh, impact your decision now. And then in the end, you will be able to get better algorithms. So, yeah, so in, the answer is in practice, yes. In theory, I don't know of any. Yes. So you end over a number of open problems when you pass. I think I'm going to open the video and like pause it every few seconds. And <laughs> but I want to ask about one of those sure. right now. Uh, so you had a known graph beforehand, and then the vertices arise with some distribution at each time. So uh, can you say a little bit more, or, or uh, give a little bit more time to understand that open problem? Like, was it to find a ratio, or was it to get an exact algorithm? Yeah, so you have to come, so in the, in the random permutation model, you have to look at the competitive ratio because the optimum online is not well defined. Unlike the online stochastic problem where the optimum online is well defined and drive it using Bellman equation. So, so there was random permutation, there was also one with stochastic IID draws from some. Yes. Also same thing yeah, so for all of these problems that I you know, mentioned, uh, we don't know the optimum solution. For all of them, we have some approximate optimum. Uh, for all of them, there is a gap. I'm happy to tell you one by one what are the techniques, but. Uh, so I don't see why the ride sharing, uh, the Uber or whatever, it needs to stick to three minutes for, like, for whatever it is, for every single person. Because if there's a difficult rider, <laughs> why not take five minutes on that person and three on the rest? Yeah, yeah true. Actually, that number should depend also on the sparsity, right? right? So maybe if you're in downtown Manhattan, you know, maybe within a couple of minutes, you will see a hundred different potential matches. The situation, it should be, it yes. should be you know, predetermined like that. Yes. Um, Apparently it's not, because I waited anything for one minute. <laughs> 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 yeah. This is how much how patient people are. Sorry? No, I mean, even in the worst case model, of course, in practice it's 12 minutes, but it's not three. Uh, but uh, for your algorithmic purposes, uh, to prove bounds and so on, yeah, you know, absolutely. Why don't you take that kind of model where whenever you get a difficult ride, rider who's you know, located somewhere else, you'd spend some more time on it. Yeah, I agree. And also, you know, again, this comes to the sensitivity to cost, you know, cost of waiting. Yeah. Even in the case of, say, you know, kidney matching, some people need you know, kidney right. immediately. Exactly. Exactly. Some people have some time right. to, you get to a wait. Ratio, um, well, one hopes. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not clear. Okay. Like, again, you add another parameter, you know, the worst case can get worse. Okay. So. I mean, would you get a better competitive ratio? The question is, what is opt now, right? Opt also presumably should uh, right. uh, should follow. Yes. Oh, right. So that's yeah. that's why it's not clear whether it gets. Yeah. You have to redefine that. All right. Thanks a lot.